Your kids are soft. You lack discipline. We landed on the moon! You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility. I slap you for God knew we are. Explorers, pioneers. Got to make it exciting. Let's get it going. I don't know what time zone everybody's in. So somebody's probably eating lunch. Somebody's maybe getting ready to go to bed. If you're Seth, that's definitely you. Follow. Yeah. <laughs> Just woke up. We're ready for bed already. Uh, welcome back to another Week in Review. This is episode 29. Today we're going over... 29? That, guys. Uh, genetics and labs. The original plan was to go over... Over... <laughs> his genetics and labs his and possibly daniel's that is way too much stuff uh some more bang for your buck for sure by going over in detail one person's uh precision medicine data then the plan is if it works out we'll see how it goes over time um no worries we'll uh we have to make room for andrew huberman anyways so we, you know we get it um that uh it says we have other people let's oh jaden didn't have camera I don't know. How come I can only see two people? Uh, you know, these two people there we are go. the ones not to ask. I got it. Um, but over time, maybe in another month, because I don't want to just do back-to-back -back episodes, we'll do uh, Seth's data. Then we'll do Daniel's. And then we can look at correlations or non-correlations across different people that are all males, somewhat around the same age. Uh, so you can see differences and similarities and then how we would approach these, even though they may be dealing with some of the same things. So let's dive into it. And I'm going to uh, do my HIPAA due diligence. Do you mind if I screen share your personal information with all these people right now? By all means. Okay. Now, what I'm going to try to not do. He's going to cry later. <laughs> is I'm still letting people in here. I'm going to try not to show... Pertinent, pertinent data. Dr. Fesco. All right. So let's go over. That's oh, got our address on it. Perfect. So I'll screen share this so you guys can see it. Can everybody see this lab data over here now? Picking that up. Cool. So let's take a look at this stuff. Labs to me are nothing more than a snapshot in time of what's going on with somebody, right? It's obviously, uh, we can see on both of their labs and we'll talk about Alex's, how, what they did that morning in terms of fasting, but also training, um, you know, in the week and the day of, uh, led to, so you can see there's some things that are out of normative ranges. So the first thing that it brings up is normative ranges on labs in particular, a company like LabCorp that has grabbed up a bunch of other labs. And how do they get those lab norms? It's just based on epidemiological values of normative ranges across the population. What population? The U.S. I think we'd all agree the U.S. is not the healthiest place on earth. Um, so when they grab this normative data, in my opinion, it's already skewed towards unhealthy. And then we say that some things are normal or not based on those healthy or not healthy norms. And that's not cool. Uh, now, when we look at like a... Uh, CBC and like a Kimzyme, these are pretty accurate, right? When you get into things like, okay, the levels of cholesterol, vitamin D, those are the ones that we can kind of talk about, like, well, what should the levels be? And some of that was in here. So we can see on Alex, uh, high potassium, high albumin, both of those play into or could play into things like dehydration, right? Training, the, uh, the amount of exertion you did in the week prior, the day of, um, we see a little decrease in insulin. Um, and I'm saying a little decreased insulin in a guy, his age as fit as he is, is a big deal, right? Uh, vitamin V12 is through the roof, which you'd be like, man, that's awesome. That is not awesome. Uh, and we'll, we're going to decipher all this as we go through it. See that folate is also high. And if you, you know, know anything about functional medicine, you're already like, okay, I got a good idea what's going on. Total cholesterol is one point high. <laughs> the funny thing is that, you know, 15 points high is still shown to be cardioprotective. So we see somebody from the, you know, in this range, 200 to 215 range, it's still cardioprotective and people live on average five years longer in that non-normal range than people that are in the normal range. It's asinine. Um, 
And then his LDL cholesterol, we can see is what's slightly elevating because that's 14 points over, but his total is only 201. So what's that mean? HDL is maybe a little lower than we want. The ratio is a little bit off, blah, 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 blah. We'll get there. Okay. Everything else, because again, just because they put all those down doesn't mean we just look at those and we're like, oh yeah, it's the bad stuff. You look at the, you know, the entire lab is a narrative of what it's telling you. Um, and that's why when we look down here, let's find his A1C. So A1C for Alex is 5.2. That is higher than I would like to see in somebody his age that's healthy. Ideal world, it's below 5.0. Believe it or not, I know this says below 5.7. Did you know now you can be 7.0 and still be pre-diabetes? That's insane. <laughs> that's absolutely insane. Um, so we want to see a little bit better blood sugar regulation over the, you know, the summation of 30 days, um, than Alex is having. Well, we also see that he's having an issue with insulin regulation. It would look like insulin production. I'm going to, I'm going to assume it's regulation. Um, so let's kind of just start going through this piece by piece. And I wrote all this stuff out. I can, you know, share some of this stuff with you if you want later, uh, the first one, and I prioritize these, is the low insulin. Um, we all know what the term insulin sensitivity means. This is the opposite, right? He's not producing more insulin than he needs. I don't think he's also in the burnout phase of insulin sensitivity where he's overproduced for so long that he is no longer producing, right? I don't think that's the case. What do I think is going on? Uh, in my opinion, as we go through this, there's going to be recurring themes. And part of this is going to have to be like a history taking with Alex that we've already done, but we're kind of theatrically presenting for uh, everybody on the podcast listening today. Um, Alex runs a little hot. And what I mean by that is not thermoregulation, but um, he's over here right now shaking his leg under the table like he's, I don't know, playing Mario Kart and he's pushing the gas pedal. He likes to whistle and snap. He doesn't sleep well. Um, not necessarily that I would say he's like high strung, like uh, on the edge, a lot of energy, hard to go to bed, hard to stay asleep. Um, so then when we see, okay, he's having low insulin. Well, what do we know? One of the first thing that is affected when you have poor sleep habits, insulin sensitivity, right? So even though he may not be in this burnout phase of insulin resistance, when we see some of his genetic data paired with the fact that he's fairly lean, his A1C is a little higher than we like, which means what? His blood glu glucose is totally normal on this test, probably maybe even a little lower than we would like to see, but he was fasted. So if I get Alex 10 a.m., you drink coffee? That's Sometimes, out, like yeah. Four ounces in the morning. But post-coffee, post-breakfast, right? At 10 a.m., there's a high likelihood that his blood sugar is kind of cruising higher than I would like it to. And then maybe we see lulls because sometimes when we do these podcasts, we like just look over at Alex. Sometimes he's kind of falling asleep, but he doesn't sleep that well. That happens every once in a while. Not just in these podcasts, but sometimes. It happens to us all, the best of us. Yeah, Rich caught me at strength training. I will also say too, like if it's just like middle of the day, he talks about how he can't nap. But if he tries to not nap and he like tries to... I mean, read a book or lay down to read a book he's out yeah i mean he can go like minutes and he's gone so we're if you listen to i listen to andy galpin's podcast on tim ferris which i think all of you should it's very very good it's literally it was like kind of mind-blowing not the information but i was like oh my god he's talking about what i think's going on like he's approaching he can't approach pain is what he would say but he's approaching performance from physiology even when we're dealing with musculoskeletal Right. Tim Ferriss is telling about his back pain, all these things going on. He's like, dude, what's your respiration rate at night? How much protein do you have in the morning? All these things that would lead to physiologic effects of non reparative or non restorative uh, scenarios around a le legit injury. And part of that was led by the fact that Tim Ferriss said, well, hey, I did a water fast for a week. All my pain went away. Okay. Well, that isn't mechanical. Does that mean it's inflammatory? Maybe, maybe not, right? There's not just inflammatory, non-inflammatory. There's a whole chemical cascade that goes on in the human body all the time. Back to Alex. Um, the next one on the list, when we see that there's some sort of, whatever you want to call it, blood sugar regulation issue, minor, 5.2 A1C, higher than I like on a healthy person, with a low insulin production, there's a hormone backbone there. We all know that you know insulin is a hormone or kind of a pseudo-hormone. 
it's signaling, you have signaling, you know, both uh, forwards and backwards. Then we get into which it should have been evident just off his labs with high folate, high uh, B12. He does not methylate B vitamins at all. That's why they're just cranked up in his system, right? He's got a lot of them. But you were taking a multivitamin, right? Yeah. Um, and the folate was methylated though. Harsh. But the other thing is if you have cer certain genetic SNPs, you have to have certain predecessors to just methylfolate, right? To make uh, these things happen. And if you look at like... Uh, Methyl guard from Thorn, it's going to have some of those things in it that allow it to kind of go through these processes. Um, so B12 and folate are high. We want to test those for a variety of reasons, but they're a good look into that. The high potassium be highly correlated with what? Either dehydration or lack of sleep. High albumin, dehydration or sleep. Albumin, you can also tie in chronically with inflammation. I have no clue if his albumin is chronically high because this is just a single shot. If we tracked it over time and it's high, I'm look, thinking some sort of chronic inflammatory cascade. What was not high on these tests though? CRP, right? Which would be maybe if we wanted to categorize it, our more um, acute uh, uh, inflammatory marker and then ESR a little further out. Those were both normal, right? So that's where I kind of have to be like, eh, maybe that's not the case. Uh, maybe they were, you know, both because they had some of this stuff. Maybe they're just a little bit dehydrated that day because you will acutely affect things like albumin and potassium. Obviously those are pretty sensitive, but I don't think that's the case um, on this one. Um, so those are the big findings on labs. This is where, in my opinion, labs on their own, if I try to take action at this point, yeah, I might surmise what be methylated B vitamins. I think we could pick that one up pretty easy. So yeah, that's a good call. And then that's going to have a whole cascade of effects on other things, right? In particular, like iron binding, um, gut motility, gut absorption. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, insulin receptor site sensitivity, maybe, maybe not. Um, there are cofactors that definitely are used in that process um, that need to be methylated. My guess would be that there's like a couple issues going on and that the methylation is affecting Alex's sleep or inability to methylate along with a few other things more than anything. And then his lack of good sleep, right? Or restful sleep is affecting things like um, potassium, albion, his insulin, uh, glucose regulation, and then it's happening in a chronic nature. Is everybody with me on that? So I don't think there's ever, maybe there is, and I'm just not good enough. I know it's called precision medicine that you're like, it's this one thing. I think it's always a few things, just like a musculoskeletal case. Yeah, there's a predominant factor, but there's these other things that I'm still treating. So now let's stop the share on his labs. Let me know if you have questions on that. Labs are pretty much like, I see what I see. Let me go to the genetic data, see what I see over there. And then I might be able to answer some of the questions of what's going on outside of your, you know, day-to-day -day or environmental stuff. Is there anything with the testosterone that we talked about before? Yeah, your testosterone, what was it on there? Five, six, 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 660, 670. 660, I mean, yeah, when we talk ideal range, is that ideal for somebody, how old are you, 26? 26 years old, that's super active, de decent muscle mass, lean? No, I don't think that's high enough. Um, you know, free testosterone is not terrible. Sex binding globulin hormones, right? And smack dab in the middle for you. That does matter. But if I had to pick something to work on to improve your testosterone, what's it going to be? Sleep. Sleep. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. Uh, so you're trying to lead yourself back to the same conclusion over and over. Um, and I think that's anybody that whatever you want to call it, functional med, precision medicine, just trying to be healthy. That's what you're trying to do. Okay, so let's show his genetic data now. And on here, I'm not gonna go through his three by four analysis. We could all read this stuff. The whole thing is how would you help a patient, right? Or if you are a patient, how would somebody help you decipher this? Um, so what I'm gonna pull up is what I broke down. So I'll pull it up first. Uh, when we go through this, if nobody's ever done this, you have a rubric of low, medium, high, very high. That's the impact, not necessarily negative or positive, just uh, predilection. 
Then they uh, go a little further and you have this little asterisk mark or a shield mark on specific SNPs. The asterisk is going to be negative impact or likely negative impact. The shield is going to be likely protective or positive impact. That's how they decipher it. As you walk through this report, which I hope you all can see, they walk through your biggest issues. So his issues from a genetic SNP standpoint would be how he regulates inflammatory cascades, oxidative stress, mood and behavior. If we just stopped there and said, if somebody's got issues with those three things and doesn't sleep well, or they don't sleep well because of those three things, it's just chicken and egg snowball out of control right away. So that's where as a clinician, you have a decision to make. I think Alex's issues are coming from his lack of sleep. I would argue that he has a hard time sleeping because of his genetic predilections. And then that's being reflected in labs and his sleep outcomes. That's my take on it. And because so many things repeat here. Um, so let's kind of go down to the bottom. Cause again, this is more patient, like patients could read this. Like one says mood and behavior, you're likely susceptible to mood imbalances. Well, cool. I, if I tell somebody that as a clinician, like, yeah, cool. I read your report. Like you can do that. I like to go down to these. So they're going genes by pathway. And then you can say, um, they give you the color codes, like, you know, purple is the most impactful. There's a little rubric up here. I don't even know where it's at. Cool. Basically colors, uh, dictating what's, uh, the most impactful or least greens, the least purples, the most. And then you can see these little stars like on COMT over here, see that little star that's most impactful in a negative manner, BHMT shield. Uh, lower impact, right? Just do um, to where it's at on the methylation pathway, but still um, it's a methylation SNP, which now you have crossover effects, which he has a couple of these. And we'll get to probably your biggest complaint outside right. of sleep is what? Musculoskeletal aches and pains, like random, yeah. my elbow, now it's my knee, now it's my hip, now it's my back, but he moves pretty damn good. Uh Am I picking up feedback from somebody or is that us? I keep hearing like a, unless there's a chip, is there a chipmunk loose in here? Maybe there's a chipmunk. There could be. Um, so again, you can walk down this and now what you have to do is you have to understand, okay, how to, what do each one of these genes actually do? That's the bigger deal. Oh, you're good, Connor. Um, so to elaborate on genetic data, you just kind of have to start digging into you know, all of these genes, certain SNPs counteract each other. Some of them, it's not necessarily on or off. It's uh, like, you know, Ben Lynch would say like slow or fast, right? It drives another gene to have to pick up the slack. Then that gene picking up the slack causes issues. So that's like understanding the pathways. So literally, if we just go down Alex's list of the negatives first, so the genes that may have a negative impact on a system and then start talking about Okay, we know his complaints, consistent aches and pains of a variety of, you know, uh, kind, um, even though he eats healthy, exercises, moves well, knows about, you know, pain, pain science, how to treat himself. He knows all these things. So you think like, man, why does this guy keep getting kind of banged up or have pain? That's why we started digging into this stuff with him. Well, we know sleep is probably his biggest uh, pillar of health issue, Right. Got spiritual component down. Um, I, we talked about meditation. You seemed like you were scared of that, so maybe that's not yeah. happening. I will also say I really I'm I'm curious if I brought up um, like Lisa did labs on me long long time ago, like probably 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. and my sleep was worse then. Mm -hmm. Like it's better than it was, but I mean it used to be two hours to fall asleep every night. Couldn't stay asleep for longer than 15 minutes probably mm -hmm. um now i don't know what's she had me on a ton of supplements mm -hmm. and things then but i'd be curious some of the like things you mentioned with chronic uh inflammation or if those were the same back then as they were now from the any, genetic report she or? didn't do any genetic report back then no, the genetic just, report all, wouldn't change well yes i meant the blood labs oh i don't know um could be i would say your ability to suck up or tolerate bad stuff right happening lack of sleep or whatever the kid's gonna be way better now so you just may yeah. be getting worse at picking up the slack um so this first one this 
ACE gene. Um, this basically provides instruction for making angiotensin and converting enzyme. If uh, well, I'm with Logan, we had a different physiology teacher. I hope we would all understand that pathway and what's going on. But for Alex, what's that mean? We saw what, what was off on his blood work. Potassium, albumin, we said that could be associated with dehydration, right? It's not, we're not saying sodium balance, even though that's what we kind of think here initially, but it's all kind of electrolytes basically because you're doing what with ACE? Getting your kidney and your lung to kind of cross talk to affect things like what? Blood pressure. I mean, that's, you know, ACE inhibitor. So in this scenario, immediately we're already saying, man, yeah, this guy's healthy. He literally said how many, he has this, you know, a shaker bottle. He drinks six to seven of those a day. Now, maybe there's not enough electrolytes in it. We don't know what kind of electrolytes he's losing in ratios, right? We haven't done a legit sweat test, um, which you can use. We'll get Gatorade sweat patches for these guys, which is good. Nick's is better. Um, but already I'm like, well, there's one tick in the box of like, we've got to hone in on how you do that. Since you're an endurance athlete, you're working out almost every day of the week. You work out every day. Six days, six days a week, you're not sleeping. So your stress level is already high. So, you know, you burn through minerals and electrolytes faster than other people would as well. So that's one tick in the box of like, okay, let's hone in on your hydration status outside of sleep. We already know sleep's an issue. Like we know we got to fix that just from a subjective, uh, you know, account. Um, ACTN3 is a gene that encodes um, alpha actinin 3, which is a protein that produces powerful contraction in glycolytic type 2 skeletal muscle. You'd be like, how is that a negative? This is a power gene, right? So, a power athlete like Usain Bolt is going to have a hom homozygous allele of this. That would be the likelihood. Well, uh, for somebody like Alex, if you have this and you have some of the other things like the inability to methylate B vitamins, where do methylated uh b vitamins come into like the krebs cycle well they're all over the place right so if you can't create atp efficiently and you're out there doing endurance athlete things which still are some power output just over a long period of time and you're running through your ability for your mitochondria to create atp and kind of run up against this like immovable force of trying to create energy with cofactors that don't exist for you guess what happens neurochemistry dysregulation, neurotransmitter dysregulation. And then you can see some of those other genes. He can't clear neurotransmitters, nor can he create some of them as well. That's so, a fancy way of saying slow. No, no, this no. A, like slow, like Ben Lynch slow, or he would be slow. Like not fast in terms of sprinting. <laughs> no, 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 no. He would be a fast, he, this is a power gene, but the reason they're saying this is bad, I'm trying to explain what uh, three by four is saying. If you can create a lot of power, right? Even though I get that there's not purely anaerobic and purely aerobic work. Um, that anaerobic work when you can't use the cofactors appropriately is a lot harder to keep up okay. than if you could. So it would be if you're, we would assume Usain Bolt methylates like a beast yeah. and can create energy without yeah. oxygen on the fly. Even though that's, I get, that's not real. Everybody bites everybody's head off on yeah. aerobic, anaerobic cut limits. I get it, but that's what we're thinking. So for you, that's why it could be bad because you're going to burn through them. You can't create or knock them off as well as other people. So then if you go lift weights, even though that's a good thing, it's yeah. not the best for you because you don't handle oxidative stress very well. Mm -hmm. And your inflammatory levels run a little high due to genetic preset. That's what we were very curious about when we got the uh, preliminary, just looking over the results, because ours were kind of flipped on what we expected in terms of that, in terms of the power, because like for all of, you know, we've both been running since we were 12, right? Now you grew up playing more. Okay. What? 14? About 16. Okay. All right. But you also played baseball. So he had a little bit different background, um, like Seth's wheels on a on a sprint are way better than mine like night and day i mean you would absolutely he's also trained that though sure but even in high school like when we had both had a similar training age your 400 would have been way faster than mine and i just never felt like at the end of a race that i could kick it into a gear it was always like pass people in the middle of the race because somebody's going to come get me at the end so and there's other fat. We know there's other factors, central governor, mm -hmm. ability to push hard, like all these things, muscle fiber type goes beyond genetics. Like this isn't saying you have a muscle fiber type. It's sure. you, have, you have the ability to create that like fast synaptic or synaptic connection. Um, 
Okay. So then APOE, we've all heard this. What's it associated with? We all think it's kind of the Alzheimer's gene. The interesting thing is you can see here, um, we saw that his cholesterol is slightly elevated. Their are cholesterols in his kind of medium, like you, you know, got to watch it. We know that higher cholesterol in particular, a little higher HDL is cardioprotective and neuroprotective. And the whole um, thought behind, well, why do genes like APOE exist is when we were cave men and women, if you had a better clotting factor, that's why you see placking in people's brains with an APOE homozygous allele. If you clotted better than somebody else and you almost cut your arm off wrestling a saber tooth tiger, you're going to live. That would be the thought process behind why these genes that are bad for us when we live to be 70, 80 years old were good when you died when you're 29. Because mm -hmm. does that jive? That's the best explanation I've ever heard. Um, not saying that's right, but I cannot remember the researcher that was on Peter Atiyah was basically talking about, like he asked that question, and he, like even Peter Atiyah, I remember being like, oh, yeah, that's pretty, that's a good explanation. I'll, I'll take it. Um, so all we're saying here is, okay, he has um, the ability to, or maybe the uh, worse ability to kind of deliver cholesterol than other people. So if he has higher cholesterol, he may not deposit it appropriately. That's also going to be based on other blood work we can do, like what? ApoE, ApoB, seeing, you know, what those Apo lipoproteins kind of look like, Um and then seeing, okay, yeah, your genetics are saying this, you actually have that. But I'm telling you right now, if you can't methylate B vitamins and you got some gut issues going on, which you dealt with IBS stuff in high school, right? Middle school. Yeah. Middle school it doesn't matter what those APO proteins are doing because like, you're not going to be able to synthesize those proteins to the, uh, the best ability. Uh, next is COMT, which plays into the clearance of neurotransmitters, in particular catecholamines. The like I have this kind of uh, homozygous allele. This one plays into like mood regulation. People that can't basically remove those neurotransmitters off the synapse, then have to deal with it longer. And the longer you deal with it, the more agitated you can get. So even though serotonin is a great thing, if you can't remove it right off of that kind of free nerve ending, that's not great for your body to try to deal with. So that's where people that tend to get a little more OCD, shaking their leg, agitated easily, uh, you know, bipolar behavior, they're having a hard time creating sometimes, which gets into gut axis stuff, but then removing um, neurotransmitters because neurotransmitters can be excitatory or, or depressive, but most catecholamines are what? Excitatory. So your brain's kind of like, yeah, ah, ah, ah. And then we try to do things to regulate that move a lot, right? Stem, like the, it's kind of goes with the theme. We're not saying that he's autistic or anything, but, um, no, might be, um, Theo, Theo Vaughn, everybody's got a little bit of autism, uh, <laughs> but we're still seeing, okay, if he can't get rid of neurotransmitters, that doesn't help anybody sleep. So even though we have four ounces caffeine early in the morning, we're exercising, which actually does what creates a plethora of catecholamines that you got to deal with. Um, and then you might get to like 7, 8 PM and you're starting to try to wind down your brain, you know, a little bit, dude, I can't. And you even, you know, maybe you feel tired and you can't go to bed. Mm. Um, so again, from Ben Lynch, that's called a slow COMT. He just kind of, you know, spectrums them versus like an on off, um, GPX one ubiquitously express many tissues where it protects cells from oxidative stress. You'd be like, well, how in the world again, is something that protects cells from oxidative stress, a negative impact. Because it can run out of control. So what's the biggest uh, oxidant that we produce as a human? Like what's the thing that causes the most oxidative stress? Like hydrogen peroxide molecules, right? That's what you're creating, like H2O2 in your body. Um, so if you have little scavenger cells that are going around looking for that, and you have a gene that's going to uptick those, right? It's kind of saying, go look for it, go look for it. You have more oxidative stress being expressed. What are you doing? Antioxidants are great until what? You got too many of them. And they on their own, which in a weird switch, they become oxidative stress on their own. So as you're trying to get rid of the rust on the car, they start to create oxidative stress through like cellular overload. It's still a cell that has to work. You with me on that? And any cell that has to work has cellular me metabolic waste output and you have to deal with that. And that's kind of where, again, this is just saying it could be. We have no clue how these genes are being expressed in him at this time. What gives us a clue? 
what's going on with him, his symptoms, his labs, give us maybe a little more detail sometimes. Um, but over time, it would have to be what? This is where we'd love like wearables. Listen to that Andy Galpin podcast talking about respiration rate. Uh, we know HRV has been looked at, you know, wildly for the past five to seven years, just sleep quality. How much sleep are you getting? You know, how accurate, um, they talked a lot about, you know, how the heuristics of like aura and, um, whoop are still based on sleep study models and where Andy Galpin's kind of sleep lab, I can't remember what it's called revive or something like that Mm -hmm. is not based on basically a sleep study kind of methodology. So they're basically taking the data that you've got from sleep studies for the past 30 years, Mm -hmm. using an algorithm based on your heart rate and respiration rate and saying, this is what we found. He's like, well, yeah, that's still based on a methodology. That's not that great, which kind of makes it a little bit flawed. I would be curious about with wearables because like, Whenever I, I don't really pay attention to the sleep data on my, on my Garmin, Mm -hmm. but if I ever do look at it, it'll say like, you were awake for one minute. And I, (laughs) like, I know that I wake up. Which is all based on movement. Every time that I, cause I I sleep on my sides and I toss every time I toss, I wake up and that might happen numerous times a night. Cause these are purely the accelerometer is the thing that's dictating the sleep, right? The movement of it. Um, so I, I mean, that seems crazy that. Yeah, it'll always be like, usually it's like single digit numbers unless I literally got up and like yeah. moved around. Koros is pretty good. Koros is supposed to be just under accuracy of Aura. I just got another Aura ring. I used it for a long time. I used Whoop for a long time. Um, I don't know. I'm going to pay more attention to respiration rate. They had some interesting data that they were talking about in that podcast. So again, go listen to that. Uh, next up, MAOA, Gene. Uh, this one... I don't, I don't know. It makes me think of people that are doing like ketamine and things like that. Cause it's in this uh, category, but uh, monoamine oxidases, uh, again, molecules, uh, that, uh, help break down oxidative stress within our body through enzymatic reactions. So if he doesn't have the ability to do that as well as other people, he can't cleave off those neurotransmitters again. And here we, it's this whole thing. So things that go together are like COMT and MAO or MAOA. And there are supplements you're going to see here pretty soon. I go through like practices and supplements. And I'm going to tell you like supplementation, why I'm pointing at it, not just like, hey, this makes you sleep better. Um, the uh, catecholamines in particular that it kind of helps uh, cleave would be serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline. So real quick, if we go back to the very first gene we talked about, that ACE or ACE gene, that has a large effect on the kidney. Right. So the adrenocortical complex is surrounding the kidney, right? It has a large effect on the kidney. So then if I go down to something where we're seeing adrenaline, noradrenaline, or maybe being dysregulated, upregulated, downregulated, we don't really know. To be honest with you, we think maybe there's a harder time getting rid of them. So they're going to stay on neurotran- or, uh, neuroreceptors longer. Then I kind of have to start thinking like, man, I got another like big focus. It's not just hydration. It's his ability to downregulate his system as best as he can, because otherwise it ain't going to happen. So he has to turn the levers and knobs because his autonomic nervous system is not going to be able to do it as well as like, and I have the same problem. So I'm not going to say as well as mine can other people's because I have a lot of the same stuff here. Um, what's up? I said as well as that. Yeah. One. Um, <laughs> what's wrong with me? Oh my what's God. That? That's why we had to do it. That's why we had to do a different podcast. We had two different episodes. Um, the next one is PEMT, and this is phosphatidyl, uh, phosphatidyl. Oh my God, let me see if I can even say this. Phonics. Yeah, <laughs> ethanolamine. I don't even think that's written right, though. Phosphatidyl ethanolamine. I don't think that's right. Methyl transferase. Um, catalyzes the novo synthesis of phosphatidyl choline in the liver. Choline largely acts on the liver and the brain. We know that, right? You have phosphatidyl serine as well. That's going to act in a little bit different function, mainly on the brain as a neuroprotective agent. Uh, you know, cholesterol is conjugated and largely uh, made and then kind of called upon from the liver. He had fine liver enzymes. We see a little bit of cholesterol issue. I have no qualms with at all, but he also has some genetics that back that up. Um I just kind of, I put this in here that the body makes a chemical called acetylcholine from phosphatidylcholine. What competes for acetylcholine receptors? Which one of the most common things? 
I bet. What? Well, you usually drink tea, don't you? So I don't think. Yeah, caffeine. Aaron, are you drinking tea again? You were last time. No, it's coffee today. Oh, so I was going to say caffeine, but it's not. Yeah, I was going to say coffee. It's caffeine. Caffeine competes for those receptor sites, right? And that's, you can go through the whole cascade of what happens at the back end of that. Andy Galpin basically told everybody they're fucking idiots for drinking caffeine. He's like, if you want to be a healthy person, stop. Use it as an ergogenic aid around training and performance only. Um, I think all of us here, I don't know. I, we all literally, I think all of us said we started drinking coffee in grad school. Like I drank it sometimes and it was grad school where it was like, yep, come on. Um, I I used to cycle it more than I do. Now I'm being honest, having two little kids, I haven't, I sleep like a baby and I, I you just th- would think like, Oh, if you sleep that much better, why would you go back to it? Cause it's yeah. addictive. <laughs> That's my thing. It's like, I've only been drinking. I didn't drink coffee until we became roommates at Logan and I've had sleep issues for nine years. Like, yeah, well before all I'm saying is it's not helping. Right. right? And the crazy thing is, so if it was worse before and it's not good now, and then caffeine does affect some of these things, you should knock it out completely for a while and to see if it's like, because one by one, Mm -hmm. but I also wouldn't say that's the biggest thing on my list for how much you drink and all these other things together. But we do see that you would have a harder time for that, even though your genetic data says you're a fast metabolizer of caffeine. Which was which one? It just says it in the report is oh. a little fancy, you know, thing. Um, but it phosphatidylcholine might be uh might help to protect the wall of the large intestine in people with a type of inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis. Uh so if you have a harder time catalyzing this reaction, we could see how that might lead to certain things like that. I don't think you're gonna end up with colon cancer or UC, but um we're looking at some of the other neurotransmitter based stuff. So now something that they don't list is like you know, the star asterisks, this is terrible. Are those because they're heterozygous, not homozygous for the two SNPs, the two MTFHR genes. But when you pair heterozygous pairs of those with the MAOA, uh, homozygous, COMT homozygous, his body is basically doing what? It can't use coenzymes that would be needed by methylated B vitamins to create ATP. And when they do, it's kind of a dirty process, hence the book, Dirty Genes. Um, and then when he tries to uh, not just you know get rid of or kind of clear the neuroreceptor sites, but even just methylating the vitamins themselves or the, the B vitamin molecule is hard, which creates what? Oxidative stress in the process. Oxidative stress happens with every cellular reaction. There's a byproduct, right? We have, this is like you know cell biology 101. Um, or physiology, I guess that like you do something, you get a reaction. Those reactions are usually what in the human body water is one. And then usually hydrogen peroxide goes with that. So those are the biggest metabolic waste. Well, you still got to handle those. Most people you have no problem, but just like if you put hydrogen peroxide on your hair, you're going to bleach it. That's why your hair goes gray. All these things. Like that's the biggest things that lead to these. It's not like hair follicle disruption or, you know, abandoning the process. It's literally oxidative stress or damage to that hair follicle. Any questions on the negative? So were you saying that yeah. the the MTHFR wasn't inherently... Uh, they don't have it marked as a complete, like, a, oh, this is the worst, just because it's heterozygous SNPs. Yeah, but the combination of the other stuff could make it... Is that where, where makes it, Ben Lynch would say, like, so it wasn't born dirty, but it can 100%. be turned. And the tough thing is, so what's the stat? 44% of people ha- are almost unable to methylate B vitamins. And then a mm-hmm. whole other cascade of people have a hard time. You have a hard time already. Then you pair those two heterozygous SNPs up with some of the other stuff like COMT, MAOA, really gets hard. Because again, just think of, you know, whether it's a Cori cycle, the Krebs cycle, how many times you run into the same molecules that you're going to have a hard time dealing with whether it's like the literal inability to deal with it because you're out of cofactors, right? Or you have neurotransmitters sitting on a receptor site that would like to basically be used at that time as like, well, go screw yourself. I'm just going to stay here. Mm -hmm. Like that's the whole dirty genes. If you haven't read Ben Lynch's book, it's a really good book. I don't know. When was that published? It's quite a while. 2018. Yeah. Um, and he used, he still has a site that I put my genetic data into that was, you know, pre three by four and all that stuff. And I showed Seth the pathways that he drew. <laughs> if you've never seen him, it's absolutely insane. It's, it's literally like, stuff. 
50 arrows and it's yeah and you're supposed to pick that apart um and then he color coordinates it for you oh at least that helps um but it is it i liked doing that because it made me have to learn a lot of that stuff and he does give you useful information it's just harder to decipher all right uh maybe the longest acronym for a gene ever ppargc1a um gene promotes methylation as a biomarker of insulin secretion sounds like that could really help this dude right here <laughs> so it's helping methylation by a signaling molecule that's tied to insulin production well the one thing that sucks is what your insulin production is a little low right so that's where we're like, okay, something is preceding your ability to signal. I don't think to create insulin. I don't think anything's wrong with your pancreas. I think the ability to signal your need for insulin is being disrupted. That would be my take. Interleukin-1, I think we're all kind of familiar with what that is, the gene, and then how it would affect you know, acute and chronic inflammatory states. But well-established for its role in the pathogenesis disorder for auto-inflammation, inflammatory disease, the effect of cells, myeloid cell, blah, blah, blah. Um, we know that one. Uh, what else, what affects interleukin-1 gene expression? Ibuprofen, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, right? I knew you were a drug addict. Yeah. But I ain't taking ibuprofen in a long time. <laughs> um, next one, this looks like it says Birmingham, but the function of BHMT is to transfer the methyl group from the betaine to homocysteine, thereby forming dimethylcysteine, which dimethylcysteine is what you need right? If you have what's called an MMR, a homo heterozygous or homozygous SNP to then be able to methylate all the rest of B vitamins. And that is what is in methyl guard from thorn. Hmm. So this is a big deal. You get somebody that has, let's say it's him, two heterozygous SNPs on MTHR. And you're like, eh, I don't think we need to do that. Or you give him, you know, methylated B vitamins. And we didn't pay attention to that. Like he has, you know, um, doesn't have this gene working for him. He will absolutely need MMR. If you don't give it to him, you're putting, you're making him worse. You're pumping him full of B vitamins again. You with me? And that's why people that take non-methylated B vitamins that can't methylate them is no different than taking or eating fortified cereal with all of these crap B vitamins. It is neuro excitatory. So if you want to, Deal with a kid that's basically going to punch you in the face, call you names, and then go to school and be a terror. Feed them Cheerios, right? Which is neuroexcitatory. Feed them a food with a dye in it that's neuroexcitatory. So it has maybe, I'm not saying it's not the sugar content, right? The carbohydrate to sugar, you know, uh, confirmation. Maybe it's a lot of these neuroexcitatory things like the, the fortification via these non- basically bioavailable vitamins, like folic acid is not, nobody can use that, right? It's that's not even folate, it's folic acid, it's not transferable. But then if you can't even use the folate, like your brain is just like sitting there like, Jesus, Jesus, I can't clear this, I can't clear this. And here, it's not that great for you. Um, COL1A1 gene provides instruction for making part of a large molecule called type one collagen. What's type one collagen make in our body? bunch of shit. <laughs> yeah. So why did they have that in there as a positive? I like to point these out for Alex, because what's one of his main complaints, consistent musculoskeletal stuff. And we're not writing it all off as just pain. He came in with a big old swollen elbow, which is what he first said to me when we were like, man, I think a lot of this tied into the backbone of your physiology. So let's take a little segue real quick. Um, Paul Blart style. Uh, you got to fall first. Yes. Um, so he had a swollen elbow. It kind of even looked like a lecanon bursitis, like not that swollen, but his weenus was sensitive. I know it's just, it, it'll make you laugh the rest of your life. Um, when you squeeze the skin, it was sensitive. That's weird, right? That like, why? Well, it has to be some cutaneous nerve in some fashion. Well, there, a cutaneous nerve can be driven nuts by like neurogenic inflammation. What is highly correlated, maybe causative of neurogenic inflammation, a trigger point. What gives somebody a proclivity to create more trigger points? You could say aberrant mechanics. You could say subthreshold work. Also, what? Central sensitization, right? Systemic inflammation. I mean, welcome to fibromyalgia, whatever you're going to call it, myofascial pain syndrome. You know, pick your poison under your name. You do that, and pretty soon you're uh, doing what I think a lot of people should do is kind of keep asking the question backwards of, 
man, I see what your labs say, but maybe your labs are being dictated largely by gene expression. Okay, your gene expression is being largely dictated by your environment. Your environment was dictated by your parents and then their, their environment, we know the three generations of epidemi you know, um, uh, epigenetics. So now pretty soon, as crazy as it sounds, he comes in with all these persistent muscular skeletal things in my history. It may warrant not just asking about colon cancer and all these things in his family, but like, dude, you know, have people been, um, a little more ramped up, had sleep issues in your family forever? Did anybody else, you know, are they a little hyperactive or they, whatever, like asking these things, not, did they have musculoskeletal pain, but did people deal with the same issues outside of your pain that you did, right? Did, uh, somebody have a hair trigger, uh, anger issue, right? I don't know. Grandma beat up grandpa or something. I don't know. Something like that. But getting deeper into it, not just realizing it's one-offs, it's mechanics, aberrant motion, overworked tissues. I think it's just a lot closer to the truth of what's actually going on in humans rather than just that mechanical side. Um, I don't think this next one, a metalloproteinase uh, key modulator uh, plays a role in differentiating cardiac stem cells. Funny thing I put down here, they have it on the report is protective for bone. Why? Well, no, so cardiac stem cell. So cardiac stem cell has to be still differentiate off the, you know, all differentiate off the same stem cell line. It says as well, as well as myocardial contraction. Come on, guy. If you go hyperkalemic or hypokalemic, what's going to get fucked with first? Yo, heart. <laughs> You're going to die. Well, um grandfather and my great grandfather both died of heart attacks so and i'm not saying that but what i'm saying is the reason they put this in the three by four genetics report under bone protective is this is a good signaling molecule for calcium you with me on that yeah so your ability to dictate how much calcium in your system is like potent and then it's basically using the stem cell formation off the back of that signaling molecule to tell where to go almost like too much calcium is that what you're saying no 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 um like a gene, like a this gene, right, is a key modulator. It's like telling things what to do, right? It's not making something. It's not, you know, uh, diffusing a scenario. Mm -hmm. um, it's a metalloproteinase that plays a vital role in differentiation of cardiac stem cells, as well as the contraction. The stem cell stuff doesn't matter for the bone. That's just like, it's telling you, but we know what ions, just like acupuncture, if you've read, if anybody read the body electric, this is getting way nerdy. Like what actually differentiates things in embryology, right? They talk about these, what I saw somebody, Jaden, you raised your hand. What do they call them? Morphogens, these kind of, you know, little, the spaces in between, you know, the embryological zones, those are ionic kind of, you know, polarized differentiation. So as you have electrical, you know, blasts as a, a zygote comes together with each cellular replication, there's literally a flash, right? This is the kind of the small big bang that is happening off of the backbone of like an eye, you know, an ion kind of action. Just same thing as putting lemon juice on tinfoil. You guys never did that in science class? No, Son of a bitch, guys. You threw the beans in the Ziploc. Somebody go grab a lemon and some tinfoil or tinfoil, aluminum foil, whatever, and just squeeze some on there and let it sit for a little bit. Um, yeah, just... Go for it. My school project put those cartons of milk and you fill a plant out of them. That sounds about right for Alabama. Yeah. Pretty good. You know what you we gotta a, say about you make that? Make a battery out of a potato? No. no. It's not a bitch. We know about it though. Okay. Yeah. I made two plants with it. <laughs> and again, this is my take on this. They don't explain why it's bone. That would be my take. So calcium signaling, I know, and we all know that is very important. I mean, the potassium, you know, potassium, sodium, calcium balance around your heart. Mm -hmm. but hyperkalemia hypokalemia will absolutely do what i mean cause your heart to stop and heartbeat no pun intended um next one lepr uh we all know what leptin is we can all see that this guy would probably <laughs> how much did you weigh as a freshman in high school oh a whopping 70 pounds get up on that microphone uh, uh 70, 70 pounds as a freshman I was also about four foot eight. So that kind of. So there was some stuff going on <laughs> early in life. It wasn't working. But now you're six foot one. What? No, I'm not six one. You're oh, six I'm one. six one. Yeah. 
I'm like what are five you? ten. Five ten, what? One fifty. One fifty. So it's quite a big of a jump. Double. Maybe you just didn't hit your growth spurt. Um, <laughs> no. But you also started working with a nutritionist, which you mentioned her name earlier, uh, Lisa, Not here locally. Sure. And I mean, a lot of that was like micronutrients, minerals, which we're going yeah. to talk about here in a second and why that may be even more important based on the genetics. Yeah. Um, and then you started gaining weight. Didn't you gain like 10, 15 pounds? Like, oh, I lost. I started seeing her because I lost weight. Right, right. But as soon as you started taking the supplementation with her, yeah, wasn't yeah. it like a... Yeah, it was pretty quick back up to... I think I was 130 in college yeah. and then I dropped and it went back up pretty quick. Yeah. Now, so, did you stop running at that point? Yeah. Did you start? Did you that was around, that was around when I stopped, like when I quit the team, that was around the same time. Probably. Otherwise you're going to, it's going to like Seth's talking. So that's kind of the genes and we could go, I mean, there are literally lists and lists, some that they thought were more important than I would think because we're trying to also what they don't have is what his subjective experience. So that's what I've got to take into account of like, Hey, I got these genes. I got to pay attention to what's kind of being shown there. I also have his lab work, which they don't. If I had to pick one of the biggest things from a practice standpoint, it would be your down regulation outside of going to sleep. But I think anybody on here be like, yeah, it kind of makes sense with what you told me about this dude, how you do that. There are a variety of ways. One of the biggest ones for you is because you work out six days a week is what you do post-exercise. So post-exercise, like you should lay in a dark room or turn the lights down or go by yourself, put something over your eyes. Ideal. Something with a little bit of weight would be ideal. Mm -hmm. um, and do just breath work for five to seven minutes. So you dump yourself back in, right? To an anabolic kind of state as fast as you can, parasympathetic state as fast as you can, but also just down regulation to try to dump some of those neurotransmitters you just utilize in the workout. Mm -hmm. That'd be my big one. And I would also say, as you guys can see here, like if you could meditate, I don't, whatever that means to you, breath work, I don't know, clear your mind for 10 minutes outside of that. Mm -hmm. Like those would be two big things. And I would not do meditation before bed and I would not be meditating in your bedroom wherever you sleep. Yeah. Yeah, like, kind of just the only thing that I've made, because it used to be whenever all that was like, I feel like when I was really ramped up, like in college, it would be some sort of movement that I would, you know, movement routine that I do before I go to bed. Don't really do that much anymore. Um, unless we're like watching a movie on like a phone bill or something. Then before I go to bed, I just read for like 15 yeah, minutes, something like perfect. that. Yeah. That's usually what I do. Yeah. Um, and we could get into all the mechanisms behind that. I'd say the big one is autonomic switching and then that kind of, you know, catabolic anabolic switch as well. Just kind of you know, meditation. What if someone like, this is not just personal. Yeah. I'm not asking for just myself, but let's say you fall asleep, like yeah. meditating because you're like trying to clear your mind. Yeah. My big thing. And um, this is echoed by a lot of people. If you fall asleep that fast, when you go to meditate, you probably have a sleep issue. And I know you think you don't, a lot of your stuff points to the exact same stuff as him. So these are both two really healthy guys that maybe don't seem like they would have, you know, any dietary issues or hydration issues. And then you look at your lab and you're like, well, something's going on, right? Seth's training for triathlon stuff. And some of that may be skewing his uh, lab work. I don't think that's all of it. Um, but if somebody like the people that get on a plane and they're immediately out, they're like, oh, I just fall asleep on planes. But, like there's some i mean you have restricted oxygen on a plane you immediately you're out like in cpr position people that are as soon as they sit down in a chair try to do like they're out like you were sleep deprived you you can tell me otherwise but until you just you know unless you have some weird uh i don't know narcolepsy or something like that like i think that's what's going on so is that your scapegoat like i can't meditate because i pass out no we could just duct tape you like no i have I mean, he's literally seconds. Like yeah. I've, I've, I've tried the meditating thing, mm -hmm. right? And like, as I'm sitting there, like I feel myself, like I have to like catch myself. Like the other thing is, like, a lot of people have argued against would you have to sit there with your eyes closed? Is that meditation? Uh, I mean, I just listened to a podcast with uh, Mark Hyman and Deepak Chopra, which Deepak Chopra is kind of. Yeah, take it or leave it. But I was telling them about an article that was published in uh, Nature and then the Journal of Psychiatry on uh, meditation as little as 10 minutes a day, reduction in almost 95% of diseases overall. I'm not talking alleviation. The only diseases they didn't see change in were genetic diseases. 
So um, regulation of your, whatever you want to call it, uh, I don't know, central operating system, whatever. A lot of that was actively directed at what was going on with them. So if you had a lung issue, you were kind of thinking about like, how do your lungs function that, you know, like this, maybe it's positive affirmation. I don't know, but they saw this, it was been published. I mean, that's a massive thing. What I would say is meditation also maybe is like running, but not listening to something, right? You're just out there running, you're breathing, you're paying attention to your breath, you're paying attention to something mm -hmm. um, because they have done studies where the same brainwave signals show up when people do repetitive movement action. The thing I wouldn't want him to do is he has a complaint of musculoskeletal issues that sometimes are associated with running. So I think you have to break association, same reason. I wouldn't want him to meditate in his bedroom if he has trouble sleeping. Yeah. I think that's just a psychologic kind of, diff, you know, diffusing. Yeah, there's literally been times where like I'll go run. There's times where I've gone and run and not listen to music because I just want to kind of take in what I'm yeah. surrounding and have that time of not having an input. And then there are times where if I feel like I'm ramped up and I've thought about those things a lot, I'll put music in so that I don't think about yeah. at some point that's going to hurt. Yeah. And I have a hard time because, I mean, I used to not listen before AirPods. I didn't listen to anything. Yeah. I mean, I same. just didn't do it. So now I listen to so many books and podcasts running. It's like hard for me to go back. So I'm like, well, I don't have that time. Mm -hmm. uh, but I used to literally, I would run no music, no nothing yeah. an hour, hour and a half meditate immediately after I ran 10 minutes using the headspace app. And then I also meditate in the morning. So I was doing like 20, 30 minutes of meditation running with none of that. I don't do any of that anymore. And I wonder like, sometimes I'm like, ah, like might be a reason. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, next we've talked about it like three different or sorry, going into supplements. So that was the practice thing. The first supplement thing is not necessarily a supplement, not because I think it's most important, but it's not a supplement. So it's just a dietary shift. I know what these guys eat pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> Because they eat the same thing every damn day. And it's not that it's unhealthy, but it lacks variety. And lacking variety, if you're going to have undue oxidative stress, that's where you're going to pay the price. Um, so what? tell us real quick, make sure you're right. up on the mic, what's your breakfast, what's your lunch, what's your dinner? He doesn't have to say any more than one day because it's the same. Here you go. Except on the weekends. Except on the weekends. All right. So morning is usually a protein shake, which involves like almond milk, uh, whey protein powder, creatine, uh, gelatin, frozen fruit, and um, so you creatine in the morning. Yeah, um, you change that. Okay, give me a suggestion. Okay. Yeah, okay. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> um, creatine is pretty recent. It's probably the last three yeah. months, three months or so. Um, and then something. Oh, I put some greens in that as well. Mm -hmm. Then that's with like Ezekiel bread and peanut butter, and that like four to six ounces of coffee. Um, on the weekends, I will drink more than four to six ounces. Like if we go to a coffee shop, mm -hmm. uh, for lunch, it's usually what it had been was either <laughs> beef enchiladas that I would make, uh, at the house, um, with like a bell pepper and an apple or like snap peas and an apple and a Lara bar. Um, sometimes it's been a rice bowl. Mine's changed more than <laughs> set, sets is constant. Uh, dinner is four eggs, um, potatoes, like golden potatoes, um, avocado, guacamole, hot sauce, um, snap peas or greens, and then uh, either like dates with peanut butter or lard bar or something like that. So there are some vegetables in there, obviously some greens, but this is what we call eating in the brown. So there's a lot of like protein and just, you know, white rice and so my big thing is what use more colors to go after antioxidants, polyphenols, things to help offset some oxidative stress. Now there have been numerous studies. I get it that show you would have to eat basically a bushel of blueberries to start to have some sort of antioxidant effect. So you create variety overall. You do eat some bell peppers. So there's flavonoids and yeah, all these. Like <laughs> yeah. The pepper seeds he eats a uh, bell pepper, like an apple. So I wanted to get him one of these little rubber bibs with a tray that my toddler Logan uses. People, shout out to Jake Shockey. That's, yeah. Uh, that's um, so we know Alex has been there by pepper seeds. Um, yeah. He has a little desk vacuum too. So um, I don't know if it's been used, but. It's because I pick up my seeds. So that'd be my big thing is variety based on colors, both from vegetables, fruits, uh, just 
you're, you're supposed to try to get as many different colors as you can. Um, and I know that's hard, but you know, we've all heard the stats of, you know, most, uh, Americans eat less than five, what is it? Five vegetables, like same five vegetables just all the time. Yeah. I mean, I guess we spinach, peppers, snap peas, used to do used carrots to do in the carrots. morning. Yeah. I got yeah. tired of carrots in the morning, but then same kind of flavonoid group and a yeah. you know, bell pepper or carrot. So yeah. Um, like literally the majority of that stems from we don't want to think about it <laughs> which i totally get but my thing would be okay you eat but, breakfast in the morning so get some like one week get blackberries next week get blueberries the next week get it's a mix raspberry. like our our yeah. our frozen fruit is it's like cherry okay. raspberry blueberry and strawberry yeah and then at night maybe start getting some different vegetables in that in that mix I should just eat vegetables in general. Yeah, that would be a good start. I'll be honest. I do not eat a vegetable. Yeah, we'll talk about you in the future. (laughs) I'm excited. Just, you know, got to let him reach his sixth birthday in his head before we get to his (laughs) talk. Three years away. (laughs) Um, We got a chat here. Let's see if it's a comment. Oven roast and veggies are the easiest way to be lazy. Yeah. I'm with you. And like, I mean, we kind of got. Sloan went vegetarian for a while, which kind of made us do a different bunch of different stuff like that. Um, I also kind of remember, and it's kind of at certain points you'd be like, Oh, I felt really good. And then you look back and you're like, did I feel better when I was eating like that or now? Like, it's kind of hard for me to remember, but like when she was eating vegetarian, I probably ate 90% vegetarian Mm. and I didn't want to, it was just what she was making and what was in the house. I would say I felt really good. So then I'm kind of makes me wonder, like, I don't think I'd ever go vegetarian, but like, I probably need more variety, more Mm -hmm. vegetables, things like that. And unless Paul Saladino shows up my house shirtless at night and beats me over the head with broccoli and tells me not to eat or something. I don't know. Um, Next on the list, methylated B vitamins. We already talked about that, this, that, and the other. I think at this point, if somebody's taking multivitamin, you would hope that they're methylated B vitamins because so many people have an issue with this. It would just, it's like hedging your bets. It doesn't hurt. It removes a step for people to have to methylate it, right? If they can. So there's nothing wrong with that. Um, Omega threes. He had, what do we see in there? He's got, you know, a little bit of maybe cholesterol regulation issue, APOE, some of the other uh, genes that are associated with possible neural placking, which even the theory of neural placking is getting questioned. Is that the thing that's actually causative or correlated with, uh, you know, dementia or neuro- neurocognitive decline, but that is associated with as far as we know now. So mega threes do a couple things. We know that they're potent anti-inflammatories. Um, we're talking about things that you could do post-exercise. So we've had Seth start some of this based on some of his cholesterol numbers, but breaking up a gram to 1.5 grams of fish oil with one would be in the morning, one post-exercise, creatine post-exercise, because uh, not only is fish oil anti-inflammatory, it signals or it's protein signaling, again, for an, or an anabolic kind of shift. Um, so that's why we'd want it post-exercise. Um, so we split the load up like that. Yeah. Here's a question. You mentioned yeah. about going with the creatine in the morning or not doing it in the morning. Yeah. What yeah. if I... So say I have two two training sessions a day. Like yep. I typically have two. I do one in the morning before I eat. So then afterwards, like that's when I eat, and I typically have creatine in my shake after. Well, uh, the big thing is the way that you shuttle, um, you know, glycogen in your muscles is basically on the backbone of creatine, and then that's kind of where you suck water volume into your muscles. My thing is with him; he's waking up, drinking water, drinking a little caffeine. He's not working out. That system, we already know he already has a hard time, maybe because of that ACE gene and stuff, like hanging on to water. Last thing I want him to do is retain in the morning throughout the day, go sweat, mm-hmm. not have anything to do at post workout, and yeah. I'm not like doing my best. Do you wake up and go pee at night? So that's Used not a problem. A yet. Time ago. Yeah. So stuff like that, you're just being as smart as you can, but does that make a huge difference? Maybe not. Yeah. But there is a quite a body of evidence for timing on creatine post exercise yeah. for glycogen reuptake. That I was curious on thing. it because it even says it on the back, like what typically 90 post. minutes post. Yeah. But that like you being an endurance athlete, I mean, that's one of your big goals is get rid of glycogen, re-upload it as efficiently as you can so you can use it. That's where I'd really tell you, like if you have a harder workout of the two, that's when you take it is after that, even if it's not a weightlifting cross training session. Yeah. Um, and if anybody has any questions on like, as we're going through this stuff, make sure you hit it. You can wait till the end too. Uh, Zinc and 
I'm going to say zinc and trace minerals because zinc is included in a lot of trace mineral um, supplements. Like if you look at it, uh, mast cell deactivation, which one thing we didn't talk about is you do have two different headers, I guess, pairs for basically uh, mast cell uh, degranulation. Like, like it's harder for you to handle histamines. Um, I don't see any of that in your history profile, right? Like if you drink yes. beer, or eat certain things, you're like, I sleep even worse or I'm having, you know, runny nose. I don't know. I would say, yeah, like I think, but it's Connor, also alcohol. I mean, yeah. Connor and I talked about that. Like whenever he was here that typically if, if we've had like probably three drinks or so, I'll wake up three or more. You wake up and it's like hard at some point it's hard to fall go back to bed. Yeah. yeah. And that can be a lot of different things. Yeah. You talk about the runny nose as well. I have noticed like you after workouts. Yeah, after workouts and like, in the morning as well. Like you feel like you constantly have to like blow your nose, I feel like. But and that could be he a also lot. had he also had like some nose surgeries yeah. when he was younger. Yeah. So. yeah. And a lot of that. I mean, there's so much there. I would say poor histamine response shows up a lot of different ways. Itchy skin post workout, itchy skin after shower um obviously you know wheels and kind of mm -hmm. hives or year to carry stuff like you don't have any of that yeah. and so the thing we talked uh, about that was uh left like meal prepping yeah yeah that's it's kind of been a joke in here because they meal prep for the whole week so everything is leftovers and the amount of histamine that builds up and leftovers especially like we get out on the four or five day mark and we were just talking about like histamine response and all this stuff I was like dude you guys are like living in the histamine world um we leftovers it that's also okay, Yes. It also depends. So protein like meat is going to have much more of a histamine load when it's a leftover versus a vegetable, just based on how that protein is being broken down. And histamine is now a byproduct of that breakdown. Um, so zinc will help with mast cell deactivation, but it also helps with the, the pathway of tryptophan to serotonin to melatonin, which for this guy, absolutely critical. So the reason that, you know, trace minerals will have like thorns, trace minerals will have zinc. I would want him to take zinc separate or like zinc pink or what is it? Pink and late or whatever separate than trace minerals, because I'd want you to take that at night, like 30 minutes before you go to bed. And then I'd want you to take some sort of like fulvic acid or shilajat or something like, I don't care, morning sometime during the day. Fulvic acid? No, no, no. Um, like fulvic acid. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's just going to be like basically minerals that are coming from volcanic ash or some fancy sea moss that, you know, some guy went up into the Himalayas, the Himalayas and <laughs> scraped off a rock. Um, you can take a bunch of other stuff. Yes. From the glacier water. Oh, the glacier water. <laughs> All the way from Alaska. Um but take them separate because the zinc is a signal, but now you don't want to take the zinc right before you go to bed. It'd be like an hour or something. And yeah. you could pair that up with if you take magnesium before yeah, bed or something. That's what I do. And that's zinc is extremely cheap. I mean, I don't know, like 15 Does bucks. it matter on the quality though of a zinc? Like, is there a thing to look at? With so yeah, all like, uh, I mean, zinc in particular has to be like built into an ioniform, right? Because you're having an ionic reaction when you have to like use that just because of a charge. So that's where just taking like uh I don't I'm trying to think the what would be in a oh like a vitamin C uh it's a powdery vitamin oh, C stuff. Emergency. Yeah, there's yeah. zinc in there. You might as well just throw it out the window. Yeah. And I'm, we could look that up real quick. Let's if you guys have a computer, look up what the zinc in by or emergency is. Look for a video of zinc going out the window. Well, that's <laughs> probably gonna show up when you look up emergency because your money is, but um, and so there's also a lot of studies being shown on ascorbic acid, not just being, uh, neutral, but actually a negative effect. Yeah. So that's coming down the pipeline. Uh, so watch your, we use, uh, like, uh, vitamin C in liquid form from like Quicksilver for people. Cause I mean, it's almost impossible to find vitamin C. that's not ascorbic acid. I mean, it's yeah. just like so hard. Um, Yeah. So we use uh, full script so you can get any brand of supplement you possibly want for your patients. They can sign up for account. And then we suggest different brands of supplements, protein, whatever it is, based on what we think is the best, right? Not just like, oh yeah, we use Thorn for everything. Some of their stuff I don't like. Um, trace minerals, like I said, Thorn has one. Fulvic minerals you can find from a couple of different companies are pretty good. Sheila's at, you can get the wool pulled over your eyes. There's a lot of companies selling that, that it's not legit. 
Um, and if it is legit, it's not cheap. Um, it's usually around $65 for like two ounces. I mean, that's like kind of the going rate It is not cheap, but it'll last two ounces will last you a long time. Um, so if you've never used the real Sheila Jet stuff, it's like glue, like you put it on like the end of a butter knife and it's like hard to get off. So you melt it in coffee or something like that. And yours is decaf. Um, what you find? For zinc? Yeah. Zinc is for good. Yeah. So basically the same formation, almost ascorbic acid. So cool. Uh, the What's ascorbic the acid. You said so zinc ascorbic. No, the vitamin C. Vitamin C ascorbic acid. Yeah. yeah. So that's what Along with the as, 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 yeah. <laughs> I can't talk. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, um, you said pickled it? Yeah. Decaf? No. <laughs> we got another chat here. Let's see what this is. Don't they still say that ascorbic acid is antioxidative, but just not as good as the whole food form? Do you not like using them at all? No. So what they're looking at with ascorbic acid is that you, oh my God, sorry, my screen keeps going away. My monitors are backwards here. From what I've kind of been hearing and reading, ascorbic acid um, over time has been shown to be correlated with like more kidney stones um, signaling in your kidney. So you're basically going to, uh, uptick some, it's almost acts like a diuretic. Um, and then if you use that long-term, cause it's in so many things, we just think vitamin C, like you need more, you need more, take it, you're sick, take more. And if you do this long-term, the chronic nature of it is bad. But when you use like a liposomal vitamin C, like Quicksilver has just a delivery agent, the formation of it's a little bit different bioavailable forms because yeah there is ascorbic acid in an orange there's all forms of vitamin c realize when we're talking like uh a lupusomal whatever or liposomal sorry whatever it's vitamin c glutathione we're talking an ionoform of zinc it's how we're delivering it and not a food form so we're trying to get the mechanism to be the same you with me so if i give somebody ascorbic acid without the fiber without the fructose, we have no clue how these things work in isolation, which is why I'm always a much bigger fan of like food first. Because supplements in isolation are kind of, we don't fully understand all the interactions. Just like that, how long is ascorbic acid? I mean, what's, uh, I'm blanking on the guy's name. Old guy that visited the islands, people's teeth, gave everybody vitamin C. Oh my God, famous. Come on, somebody help me with this. Wrote a book. No. Sure. Yeah, what was that guy's name? Oh my god, Ooh, somebody write it in here. Coming. Um, it is Robert. Uh... No, recommend organic lemon juice, sublingual instead of yeah, that would actually in uh, you know, lemon juice, like even in your water in the morning. Now you have what vitamin C, electrolytes, like yeah, that would be a good thing overall. So, Jaden uh, wrote, if you guys didn't see it, on the topic of vitamin C supplementation, I know several docs recommend organic lemon juice, sublingually instead of. A C supplement, do you have any thoughts on this? I'm just being honest and I'm really picky on stuff. I don't know why you'd have to do it sublingually. Um, I don't know if I want to wake up in the morning and just like put lemon juice under my tongue. <laughs> but I do. Um, I do in the morning lukewarm like 12 ounces of water with a little bit of sea salt and then a second glass of water kind of over a longer period of time with just lukewarm water with lemon juice like squeezed into it. And that's like my morning, every morning. So electrolytes, vitamin C, yeah. Um, I mean, ideal world, I would have lemons that I'm squeezing into my water and limes. I'm squeezing my water every morning. I'm just too lazy for that. So, you know, I just do the organic lemon juice concentrate stuff. Uh, CoQ10, this one, it, yeah, there's some like, uh, insulin sensitivity stuff that we all know CoQ10 helps with. I'm not giving, you know, Alex, uh, for that reason, it's more for, uh, the decrease in inflammatory response mediated by TNFA alpha, which he, you know, has that gene uh, snip as well. So I would say anything I can do to help with inflammation, and then it does have a bit of an effect on um, insulin uh, receptor sensitivity, well, then it's a win. And I know that seems to be, you know, everybody says if you're over 55, you need to take CoQ10. So it seems like, you know, the old person's uh, supplement. Choline, we talked about that, the phosphatidylcholine and its action on the liver and the brain. 
interestingly enough, when you're having any type of cholesterol, whether that's a delivery, so you have too many triglycerides or a conjugation issue, right? Low HDL, low high LDL, whatever you want to say. Choline um, taken over 30 days has been shown to reverse non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Now, I don't think you can crush whiskey while you're taking choline, expect it to just be like an offset. But people that are, you know, stop drinking, have a little healthier diet and up their choline intake, which what's, what's one of the foods that has the most choline in it? Anybody? I would say a fish. It has some. An egg? Egg. Yeah. Egg, oh. right. Get up on that mic there, kick back, lazy. Man, get Sorry. up there so people can hear these answers. You can fall asleep in an instant when it's dry. Yeah. I can't tell you how many lo times I've looked. If you can see me, I look over at Alex and he's just going. <laughs> and I'm talking right to him and I'm like, eh, okay. No, I'll let him go. I am interested. <laughs> now I created a gap on purpose. These are maybes. So adaptogens, I mean, adaptogens, wide open, rhodiola, ashwagandha for what? Inflammation. Inflammation, but more um, knocking you back into an anabolic state post-workout. Um, it's supposed to help with the recovery for that reason. You do get some protein signaling out of these as well for uh, uh, building muscle. Yeah, Weston Price. Thanks, Aaron. Yes. Jeez, I feel like an idiot. Don't get that one. Not wrong. Oh my God. Um, so the the thing is with that, and I just heard another, uh, I think maybe they were talking about this with uh, Andy Galpin, that almost every rodeole out there except clean, um, that company K-L-E-A-N, was uh, manufactured with something else in it besides rodeola. <laughs> so... Like a wooden pass USADA, wooden pass WADA, and they're out there selling it. So when you get into herbals, it gets real weird. So that's where I'm just like, I don't know, maybe. Um, and then you also have a limiter effect with some people that like they have to cycle on and off these because not necessarily liver toxicity, but it does affect how your liver works. So you just use liver enzymes to kind of keep track of that, right? MSM, where do you, where have you heard that talked about? If you follow the doc, the lovely Dr. Rhonda Patrick, and if you want to go eat some sulforaphane and, you know, grow broccoli sprouts instead, you could do that. Um, or you could take some MSN and then, uh, alpha lipoic, lipoic acid, again, uh, potent anti-inflammatory signaling molecule again for protein. I've mentioned protein synthesis signaling like 15 times. Cause we're realizing how important that is that like what you eat and ingest is like telling your body what to do. So you could go lift as many weights as you want, eat as much protein as you want. If it does come from certain sources, it's not as good as others, which people would like to argue all over the place. Um, but that would be my wrap up, which I thought this would take an hour of if Alex was a patient of mine that came in for functional medicine, precision medicine, they're dealing with whatever I'm attacking you like this. Hey, I know your biggest complaints to me are you know, generalized musculoskeletal aches and pains that come and go and seem to maybe not respond to treatment that great. Right. Um, and I don't think Alex is in the schlubbiest of places for treatment. So I think we do a pretty good job. So when stuff doesn't respond, we're always asking, well, why not? Uh, second, I know you don't, or maybe first, I know you don't sleep very well. And outside of that, maybe there's some other stuff, you know, I don't know that your roommate would complain about of whistling Dixie all the time. I don't know. And then I'd go through their labs and I'd say, hey, these are the things we're paying attention to acutely and then chronically. What are we paying attention to chronically? A1C, right? And the insulin. I'm paying attention to that for a long time because if we're in any of those ranges, those A, the insulin, will change faster than the A1C just from a time component. But your insulin is going to tell me if a lot of things are cleaning up. And this is, I'm, I'd be explaining it to them just like this. I expect the albumin and the potassium to change immediately. Mm -hmm. If we kind of start doing what down regulating better, you get your sleep better. Cause I don't think Alex is dehydrated. I'm going to give him some stuff to help. I think he needs, we talked earlier, maybe he needs more electrolytes. I mean, you can go overboard with that. Right. Um, he exercises quite a bit. I would say two noon tablets a week. If you're drinking seven, how many ounces are in a shaker bottle? That's a lot of water. I mean, we're talking 120 ounces. So you definitely don't want to flush electrolytes out, right? And make it harder for your body to hang on to water. But I, I think I'd see those change fast. And then we would expect the B vitamins to change like that. Like literally you take supplementation, I test in a month. It should be different because you can utilize B vitamins are water soluble. You're burning through them all the time. 
they're not necessarily building up and that's why they're high on a lab test. They're high because whatever you ate the day before it's presenting that way or whatever supplements you take, you know, multivitamin. Um, but it's very hard. You will find a lot of multivitamins with methylcobalamin in it or sorry, uh, methylfolate, but not methylcobalamin. They'll have cyanocobalamin, which we talked about was Alex's, you know, you could argue that that's, you know, whatever it's not methylated. First of all, it's also basically grown or synthesized off the back of a, a cyanide molecule and I don't, you know, take it or leave it for what that means. Um, so any questions on this, that, or the other with Sir Alex Coleman breaking down genetic labs, all the fun stuff, this is exactly how we would do it. And then I would wait for all the questions to pour in of what am I supposed to do? And I, so, because a patient's surely going to go, so wait a minute, all I have to do is take some of these supplements, try to like calm down after a workout, meditate once. And that's what you're telling me to do. And that that's a hundred percent. We're going to start with just that, because if I give you any more of that, you're not for sure going to do any more, yeah. but they expect, you know, especially if stuff's going wrong, like I need this like massive overall. No, you don't. You need to do what? Get a domino, like get one thing to knock down a couple, which also shows them that we know what we're actually doing. You're not just like giving them 50 supplements and then like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, something changed. Well, what effect did that have? You know, and if he said, Hey, I don't want to take all these supplements, I would say, then you got to be all over your diet. If his diet's not great, it's more supplements, right? Mm -hmm. So you just kind of, you're working with the patient you got in front of you. Um, and then my one suggestion that he may not like is you may not want to work out as much or you need less intense workouts. Mm -hmm. I know that's, we're all in the movement space, the exercise, you know, rehab space. I'm not saying his intensity is through the roof. But maybe for a month, he dials it way back. And he's like, hey, I'm going to make sure that any run I do is only zone two. Any workout I do, I look at like heart rate stuff and I just kind of check in with myself and let your body literally self-regulate because neurotransmitters, yes, are largely being created in your gut, but also the feed, you know, I guess the retroactive mechanism for that is being fed off of like, well, how much is there in the first place? And if you keep like ramping the system up all the time, like, well, it, it's a never ending cycle. So at some point you have to, I'm not saying take a break. That's going to go the other way, right? Like exercise is anti-inflammatory to an extent. Mm -hmm. Um, but it, there's a level to all this stuff. So maybe it's like, Hey, you just work out five days a week. Right. Or if you're going to do six, three of those got to be moderate, not, you know, no intensity with it mm -hmm. or use your breath to moderate or regulate your exercise and you're not allowed to go above like you can't not breathe out of your nose for four of those workouts whatever we want to do play around with it. it's whatever you like is sciencey is or non-sciencey as you want to go do you have any questions and if you do talk to the mic but we're talking to you so anything that you're like hmm. doesn't make sense or i mean we've talked about this a yeah. lot in the office and that's what we we wanted to present it to you guys. Like we've never done it before. It's an impossibility. So we've been talking about Alex with all this stuff forever. Mm -hmm. Um, but we just finally wanted to be like, okay, let's break down the data, really tell you what we want to do. He'll do all this stuff. And then another goal of ours is I mean, with him in three months, we'll probably redo the performance panel, um, lab wise and see what changes. Yeah. <laughs> Alex tends to pass out when he gives blood. So he's really looking forward to that. Uh, um, I really hoping you're going to say six. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but we want to see changes and then what's stubborn and what's not your genetics aren't going to change your expression of them will. Yeah. And then, you know, if that is the thing, like that may, may take more time than just, you know, having the micro and macronutrients in place and the, you know, um, parasympathetic switching that we're talking about. I did. This was a thought that I had, uh, cause as, so, I mean, Bo, you've known me for, 10 years now, mm -hmm. 10 years ish. Um, and as I like process all the things you're saying, how, okay, I'm going to make these changes, that kind of thing. Um, kind of what got me into all of that in the first place when I first started seeing Lisa was if you can believe it or not, I was way more upregulated, I would say in terms of being high strung. Um, and it was, it was like a, <laughs> it was like an action potential, like all or none, I, I had to do everything right. And if, that's, that's, if I messed up like one thing, it was going to throw it all out. That's bipolar, obsessive compulsive, whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Yeah. And so in my head, it's like, all right, I've got these supplements that I need to do these things that I could change the diet. 
we go, you know, we go get dinner on a Friday night. I don't want to go back to the, you know, well, I can't go out to eat with Seth because I'm going to think about like, oh, if I eat that thing, it's going to increase an inflammatory cascade and all these things. And that's like, that's what goes through my head Mm -hmm. as I process, all right, how do I make these changes? But how do I make it to where it's, it's sustainable, but it's not like, yeah, but think back in the way. Okay. So act like we've never talked about this before. What did I deliver to you today? I didn't tell you to eat or not eat anything other than like some blueberries and some colorful foods. I actually said eat more of stuff. I didn't say not eat anything. Right. So I didn't knock anything out. True. Which I'm very aware of because people will push back on that hardcore. Yeah. When you need to, you need to. You're not telling me you have massive IBS stuff, autoimmune triggers, like all these other mm. cool. Like you need more, you know, antioxidant load. Cool. Eat more colorful stuff more often. That's like a goal and that should make it fun. Like that's a challenge. Yeah. yeah. And then I said, you know, breath work, meditate, whatever you want to call that, that action, and then some supplements. So, and that would be on purpose with you. If I knew you were hyper vigilant, I know that you're mm-hmm. going to like obsess over detail and then like shut off certain things. I'm like, dude, that's going to run you into what stress, which is oxidative. Yeah. So again, there's legit stress, right? Physiologic stress, which is oxidative damage or maybe not damage oxidative. Uh, so they're oxidative respiration, whatever you call that. And then there's stress, stress that you perceive that then creates a physiologic response. And that's why, you know, breathing and anxiety or a inseparable loop. It's like, you know, the snake eating its tail, all this stuff is stress becomes physiologic physiology becomes stress. How you perceive it is the difference. And like, that's not my job is to tell you to perceive something different. My job as a clinician is a presuppose that more of what we're feeling and dealing with from anxiety, stress, musculoskeletal pain, aches, sleep is actually physiologic is not just psychologic is not just emotional that there's underlying things that help drive this. And I'm not trying to go EO Wilson, like, you know, social biology, like, Oh, that's how, but like, there's a lot of stuff that I think is underlying that makes the personality of something the way they are, Mm -hmm. not just this like inset, like I have a personality. There's a reason that I probably have a hair trigger. Maybe some of that is inborn personality. Maybe that's, I have the same gene structure, MAOA, COMT. My neurotransmitters get hot. I want to control everything. I'm like very clean OCD. Something goes wrong. Because you can't control it. Because why? Your brain is trying so hard to just like maintain an even keel when something goes outside that I can't control, throws me for a loop. And it seems personality but if you look at it closer, it seems physiologic. And again, it's not like it's one or the other. It's part, but again, welcome to whatever you're, I hate the term, you know, BPS, but uh, a human, right? It's just multifactorial. Uh, any other questions? So you're going to do this stuff? Yeah. Yeah. The biggest one is post-exercise. Yeah, that's what I'm going to yeah, start trying to, to do. Because I do feel like I've made, well, partially because speed work was what flares up a lot of my symptoms on things. So I've my runs are all very easy breathing through my nose um two lifts a week are probably like have a heavy component to it um, i would say you do heavy a decent amount i'm only lifting two or three days a week two of those days i'll start with something heavy and then like the other day was that row bike jump rope and all that was trying to be through my nose yeah and again, it's not that we're saying forever. We're just saying it's no different than kicking caffeine for 30 days. Down regulation period of workout, like working out or um, stuff that you're just like, hey, I'm going to take a dip down. Mm-hmm. That's where it'd be really inter- interesting if you did have something like whoop or or to see like, does maybe sleep doesn't change because that might take a lot. Because mm-hmm. um, we also know that there's brainwave patterning that is a pattern, no different than a movement compensation that's like, that's hard to change by itself. Um, but you're like, man, a lot of other stuff changed at night. Respiration rate, my resting heart rate goes down. And then we're like, Hey, keep going. Mm-hmm. Right. And then let's start adding in an, another intense workout a week. That's still the same. Cool. Mm-hmm. You know, cause I mean, who's to say that we're not talking like you're in a chronic, like red S syndrome mm-hmm. or red S, I guess that's the syndrome, you know? Um, if you don't know, you know, relative energy yeah. deficiency syndrome, whether you call it, you know, the female triad, it's not a female thing. It's not, a, you know, just male thing. It's multifactorial. Uh, I don't think that's the case, but that's kind of what it was in high, high school. Yeah. I mean, you were running into stress fractures left and right. And yeah. then 
from what I remember, the, like the micronutrient testing that you did out of that lab in Texas. Uh, yeah, funny enough, a lot of the stuff that you suggested, I feel like I remember taking. Yeah, it like, with, but you so. burn, what do you do when you're under this oxidative load and the stress load? You yeah. burn through minerals, right? They're used as cofactors and coenzymes. You burn through those a lot faster than other people. And then what do you start doing? You, you're going to go find them. Where are you going to find them? Bones, <laughs> other things. And I mean, we had a, a guy that seemingly should have been healthy. I mean, what, fibular stress fracture, metatarsal stress fracture, tibial stress fracture. I don't know. Yeah, what, a bunch of them. Like just over and over. And I mean, you know, that's where you, you just got to be a clinician. And like, it is mechanical sometimes. It is physiologic sometimes. And it's probably always a little bit of both. That's the harder thing to reconcile. Uh, let's move into any specific Q and a, uh, that would be behind just for you guys that are residency members. Thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe via YouTube, Apple podcasts, or Spotify. If you like the message, please share it. We appreciate it. Thank you.